This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please support us on Patreon over at patreon.com geeks or via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com crowdfunding. And I want to give a special thank you to Jay Lieberman, who just increased his pledge amount. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so now let's get to our show. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 527 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. I'm David Barr Kirtley, author of the book Save Me Please and Other Stories, which is available now on Amazon.com. We had a great conversation about the book back in episode 500, so definitely check that out if you missed it. And today on the show, we'll be discussing the classic 1959 post-apocalyptic novel Canical for Leibowitz by Walter M. Miller Jr. And this won't involve spoilers for everything in the book, so just be aware of that. And I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got Matthew Kressel, making his 27th appearance on the show. His novel Queen of Static the follow-up to his groundbreaking novel King of Shards, is available now, and he recently launched a newsletter of writing advice over at outerdeep.substack.com. Together with Ellen Datlow, he hosts the monthly Fantastic Fiction Reading Series in New York City. So Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dave. Good to be back. Then next up, we've got Lisa Yazik, making her 11th appearance on the show. She's Regents Professor of Science Fiction Studies at Georgia Tech and it's author of the nonfiction books Galactic Suburbia, Sisters of Tomorrow, and The Future is Female. Her new book, The Future is Female, Volume 2, The 1970s, will be out on October 18th. So, Lisa, welcome to the show. Hi, Dave. It's great to be back. And also joining us today is Joseph Reiser, who you may remember from our discussion of Brave New Worlds back in episode 485. He's the Harriet S. Wiswell and George C. Wiswell Professor of American Constitutional Law at Colby College and is the author of the book Jean-Jacques Rousseau, A Friend of Virtue, from Cornell University Press. So, Joe, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dave. Glad to be back. Okay, so let's start off with Matt and have you tell us about your history reading A Canical for Leibowitz. Oh, all right. I'm going back. Um, <laughs> so I think this book, I, I think I may have actually first read this. It was either you or John Joseph Adams. I think I had met both of you at the Fantastic Fiction and KGB reading series, like back in the early aughts. And it was either you or John, I think it was John said that this was one of his favorite books. Yeah, I'd never read this before. So it definitely wasn't me. Okay, okay. So yeah, so I, th I thought it was John, but I wasn't sure. Um, and it was this and and then uh, I think he said the stars of my destination were his two favorite books. So I was like, well, that's <laughs> high praise. I gotta I gotta go uh, check it out. So yeah, I, re I read it it's got to be more than 15 years ago, maybe. It's, it's 2004, 3, 4 when I first met John. May have been earlier than that. So yeah, it's been uh, it's been almost 20 years since I since I read it. Um, I didn't remember a whole lot of it. Uh, I remembered parts of it. So it was interesting. Uh, the the particular copy that I had had an introduction by Mary uh, Mary Doria Russell wrote to Sparrow and she said that like, you know, when she came back to it years later, it was like reading another, a different novel. And and I kind of felt the same. I definitely had a different uh, take on it this time around. Yeah. Actually the, the edition I read also has that introduction by Mary Doria Russell. Apparently there was an earlier one that had an introduction by Norman Spinrad. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. know if anyone's read that, but um, do you remember liking the book or like how like, did, did you understand why John uh, said it was one of his favorites? Um. Yeah, I mean, we can get into it a little bit more. Um, some of my opinions didn't change. Some of them did. Uh, so I, I remember before I reread it for this podcast, I remember feeling that the book kind of was a little bit of a slog for me, that it just um, I was waiting for a certain kind of I was expecting to read a certain kind of book. And that's not the book that I got. So I, I think going into it this time the back of my brain was like, okay, don't expect it to be this kind of 
a big adventure story with a central protagonist going through these things. It's, it's going to be more of an omniscient kind of thing. And so, you know, I, I enjoyed parts of it more this time, but other parts of it I had some issues with, which we, we can get into. Yeah, I guess I'll just explain right off the bat that this, this is a sort of a fix-up novel. So there were three novellas published between 1955 and 1957 in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. And uh, in 59, Walter Miller uh, took them and sort of rewrote them and put them together and made them one book. So there's sort of three sections and there's a 600 year gap between each section. And, I, you know, I I had never like I said, I'd never read this before, but I um, just, you know, I've read so much about science fiction and the history of science fiction that I kind of knew. I knew it was about, you know, I knew it was this post-apocalyptic story and that there were these monks preserving scientific knowledge and that that the, the theme was sort of this the cyclic nature of history and how mankind repeats the same mistakes over and over. So um, maybe knowing just that sort of um, outline helped me enjoy it more because I wasn't, I, I had a, a rough idea of what to expect uh, going into it. Um, all right, but let's get Lisa in here too. So Lisa, what's your history reading? Can't go yeah. for Leibowitz. So there must have been something in the air around 2003 and 2004, <laughs> because that's when I first read it as well. Uh, and I read it because that was right when my husband and I moved in together and we're both science fiction studies scholars. And so we were combining our collections, which are horrifyingly large, <laughs> but fortunately we had a lot of different things. And he's, he's a Cold War studies scholar as well. So oh, wow. he had, right, all these great classic Cold War and nuclear war uh, novels that I had never read. So, you know, I was happy to read it. I read it along with Neville Shoots on the Beach and uh, was it Pat Frank's Alas Babylon and, you know, Judith Merrill's Shadow on the Hearth. So it was sort of fun to read them all together. Um, like Matt, I found it a bit of a slog the first time, uh, but I, I knew it was episodic and I, I like those kind of novels. So I thought that was cool having the three parts. Uh, it was interesting rereading it this time. I definitely paid attention to different things in it. Um, but I have to, and we can talk about that more later, but I have to say both times I had the exact same experience that I feel like his worlds are so beautifully and vividly drawn. Like they, they're so cinematic in my head. And yet I can't help but think we never actually start the novel. Cause I just want to know what happens to Rachel. That's what <laughs> I care about. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I, I guess I'll say there was a sequel. Uh, what's but it called? she's not Saint, in it. Yeah, St. Leibowitz and the Wild Horse Woman or something like that. Right, but it's um, set back in the history. Yeah, so it's set between the second and third. I haven't read it, but right. it's, it's set between the second and third novellas. So you, you never find out. Okay. Yeah, I've read it. It's good. It's cool. Okay. It, and uh, it was finished apparently by Terry Bisson. That, right. Uh, Walter Miller had, had written, I don't know, 500 pages or something and and had an, an outline for the rest of it, but needed someone. He had writer's block. He needed someone to finish it off. I guess we can get in. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later. His whole like life story and everything. Um, but so, so um, Lisa, did your husband? Did he sort of hand this to you as like? How did he feel about it? Did he say like, "Oh, this is one of my favorite books," or "This is just like an okay"? No, no, not book, a, no. Yeah, it's not one of his favorites either. He he. We were just talking about it again this morning because I actually have no memory of what he said to me. I think we were so busy going through each other's books and just pulling books. I don't even know if we talked about it. <laughs> we were just grabbing, you know. <laughs> um, but we it, he said the same thing. He's like, it's such a beautifully written book. And he's like, I so vividly remember scenes from it. He's like, I never want to read it again. And I, I don't <laughs> even need to talk to you about it anymore. <laughs> so uh, he said maybe it did his jo its job. It, it's a terrifying depiction of, of nuclear annihilation. And he doesn't want to think about it. Huh. because we got enough other problems right now. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. I mean, a lot of the, I'll, I'll say I, I really enjoyed this. I mean, like, I guess like, like you, I, um, I found it a little dense and slow. I mean, I didn't find it to be a page turner, but I admired it throughout. I thought it was really, really smart and literary yeah. and there was a lot of interesting ideas and deep themes and everything. So I'm going to be giving overall quite a positive, um, you know, kind of like review of the book, but um, it was something that I kind of had to read it in chunks and put it down and, you know, pay careful attention to, to it. It wasn't something I just flew through. Um, but I'll say I, I do like these fix-up novels. I think they've, they've kind of fallen out of style. I mean, back in the 50s, most of the books were, or a lot of the science fiction novels were these fix-ups because there wasn't as much of a market for novels. And so authors would need to publish a bunch of short stories and then 
you know, and that's where their real money and um, audience and everything was. And then they would kind of package them in, into a book form. Uh, but I, I like, I've always liked that. I feel like it allows like in, in a book like this for there to be a, a big sweep of history, if that's what the author wants. And maybe there's a little less, um, you know, wasted space. I mean, I feel like if this came out today, it would probably be a trilogy of novels rather than, you know, a, a fix up of three novellas. So uh, I'll just, I, I always want to put in a good word for the fix up uh, format. Cause I feel like that gets maligned a lot, but, but I really like it. I'm with you, Dave. I love the fix up format. I think it's cool. Um, and I also think American writers in particular often excel at short story and novella length tales. And I, I don't, I, I just got chills and not in a good way when you talked about turning each a part of the triptych into yeah. a novel. Like I, <laughs> yeah. I like it. It's I like it the way it is. And and you're right. It's dense, but it's not going to get less dense by making it larger. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, how, how about Joe? What's your history reading Canical for Leibowitz? So I first read it in what must have been about 1990. Uh, I was in graduate school and I had a, a roommate who was also studying political theory uh, and he had recently converted to the Catholic Church, and um, w- you know, with all the zeal of a convert, uh, and, and he of course loved the novel uh, for its Catholicism, uh, essentially, and so knew that I liked science fiction and handed it to me and said, "I must read this." Hmm. And you know, it was easier to read certainly than what I was supposed to be reading, so hmm. <laughs> so I devoured it. And and actually, I really, I mean, I remember enjoying it. Um, and then, you know, when we talked about doing this podcast uh, back in the spring, I reread it then and and uh, yeah, I was just on a long plane flight the other day. And, and so just to prepare for this, I reread it again, again. And uh, oh, wow. it uh, I, so it was a lot funnier the second time. I didn't remember it anyway as being funny and, you know, just you know, that whole first scene with, with brother Francis and sort of all throughout his kind of naive, bumbling, you know, well-meaning stupidity. Uh, it's just, it's delightful. And actually there's a, a bunch of funny scenes, uh, throughout. So I, that was something I hadn't remembered. Um, and I guess I'll say the other thing is that I hadn't, you know, reading it in 1990, you know, the cold war, war had ended, you know, so nuclear war was off the table. And so this was like a quaint book from a previous era. And I guess I hadn't expected to be rereading it at a time when there's a lot of nuclear saber rattling going on. And it seems, it seemed to me anyway, like immediately relevant in a way that I hadn't expected. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, uh, if people are listening to this in the future, and hopefully there there is a future that you're... You're listening to this. Uh, you know, as we're recording this, uh, uh, all week the Russian government has been putting out various spokespeople to threaten the West with nuclear weapons if uh, Russia doesn't get its way in its invasion of Ukraine. So, um, so yeah, that's definitely a lot of the commentary, like you're saying, that I was reading about the book was saying like, oh, this is a product of its time. It you know feels a bit dated. It's it has this you know 1950s fixation on thermonuclear war. And definitely it did not feel dated. <laughs> that aspect of it did not feel dated at all as I was reading it this past week. Um, I think it's interesting that you say, you know, that it, it's a very Catholic book. I mean, um, the history there, I guess I'll go into is that Walter Miller served as a tail gunner on a bomber in World War II. And one of the combat sorties that they flew was bombing this um, uh, monastery at Monte. It was called the uh, monastery at Monte Casino. And it was, I think at the time, the oldest monastery in the Western world. And it was just, you know, blown up. And um, it's hard not to see. And, and then and then after the war, he converted to Catholicism. And so so this novel was written, you know, by, like you say, with the zeal of a, of a recent convert. Um, but it's hard not to see those two things um, affecting, you know, how mm. this novel came out very, very strongly. Um. But so I don't know, Joe, is there anything else more you want to say about the the Catholicism or like any of those things you were just mentioning? Well, I mean, you know, I think one's reaction to the book is is bound up, going to be bound up in a certain way with one's reaction to that. I mean, especially in the third part, um, 
you know, your what let your will be done. Um, when you know we have in the aftermath of the what warning shot nuclear attack on the capital of Texarkana, uh, you know, we see the irradiated victims being treated at the monastery and the abbot at that time, you know, sets his authority four square against euthanizing the people in terrible pain who are so badly irradiated, they're going to die. And I think, you, you know, and, and you get the abbot's account of why this is wrong. And, um, and of course, he fails to persuade the the young mother whom he's trying to persuade. And so she goes off to the euthanasia center uh, and fails to persuade the authorities. And I mean, I guess both sides in this debate are presented very sympathetically, reasonably sympathetically, although it's quite clear uh, that you're supposed to like uh, the abbot's view. Um, and I mean, just having a, a soft spot for that way of viewing the world, I, I really admired that, but I, I could see one coming away from that, having just exactly the opposite reaction that, you know, how, how can our sympathies lie with, you know, those, those, those who would advocate the, the continued, continued potentially needless suffering. Yeah. I, I I thought that was one thing that was really interesting about the book is that if I hadn't read Walter Miller's biography, I would have had a hard time saying where his sympathies were. I mean, to me, it seemed very, you know, I mean, he's obviously really, really interested in, in Catholicism and takes that very, very seriously. But then he's also obviously knows a lot about science and is really, you know, has this sort of um, technophilic engineering interest and yeah, all, all the characters' views are, you know, nobody's like a, a cardboard straw man kind of figure, at least the major characters. I mean, like, uh, I don't, I think if I was just reading this cold, I would not have necessarily been able to tell you mm. what his, you know, what his viewpoint is, which I think is, uh, generally speaking, a pretty good thing in a, you know, a, a work of serious literature that it's not just a, a sort of didactic, uh, you know, political tract or something. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah. Are uh, any just, of the rest of you Catholic or cradle Catholics? I, I grew up Catholic. No, I, yeah. was, I was raised uh, conservative Jewish. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, for me, reading it, this is the second time through, obviously, it, it's definitely from a Catholic point of view. And there were certain, like, very obvious... Um, blind spots in this uh, that made me wonder. For example, like the Roman Catholic Church initially was, uh, you know, for science as long as like science was in the discovery of, of God, right, of, the, of, of God's universe. But then once, you know, for example, Galileo, once scientists started to discover that some of the things that they were finding didn't mesh with the teachings of Catholicism, that they were suppressed, right? And and so it, it it seemed odd to me that it was just this default assumption, like, oh yes, of course the church would protect science. And to me, I was like, well, that you're really alighting over this long history of the church actively suppressing discoveries that were antagonistic to, to those beliefs. So I, I wanted more of that kind of tension, you know. And then um, just like the depiction of, of the Benjamin, the quote unquote old Jew, you know, was pushing a little of, of my anti-Semitic buttons. Like it, it, it wasn't like fully anti-Semitic, I guess, but it, there, like he had a name. His name was Benjamin, but the Miller kept calling him the old Jew. Right. So I was like, all right, you know, and then it was it was pushing a little bit too close to the the, the wandering Jew trope. So I, I was sort of wondering why that like it was kind of just a stock Jew. Like and then the other thing was Leibowitz himself. Right. That the Saint Leibowitz, he was Jewish. Like it says it in the in the text, Isaac and Ed, Edward Leibowitz. But he just drops his Judaism and becomes a monk. 
a part of this order. So I was like, that's weird. Like, there's no discussion of him just being like, well, I going to drop my faith and join this order. And it's, it's one thing if, if the order was um, specifically designed to be this secular thing in, in service of science, but it, it wasn't, it, or at least that it wasn't presented that way in the text. Well, let, let me just for listeners yeah. now. Let me just explain the the setup a little bit more. So, so this, yeah, we're we're six hundred years after a thermonuclear war that basically destroyed civilization, and in the wake of this, um, people kind of rose up against science and blamed scientists and intellectuals for causing this nuclear war, and basically went around killing scientists and intellectuals and burning books and stuff like that. And so there was the scientist Leibowitz. And he sort of was given shelter in some sort of monastery or something and uh, either started or at least was a major participant in this effort to preserve knowledge. Uh, there were people called bookleggers who were smuggling books around and memorizing the contents of uh, sacred, you know, of classic texts, important texts and stuff like that. Um, and so, so in this world now, 600 years after all this has happened, um, you know, like there's like mutants and, you know, there's, there's very little, uh, civil order and stuff. And people have basically, you know, all the events of the past have been mythologized to such a degree that, um, our, our main character, brother Francis thinks that fallout is, is some sort of d demon or something. Cause he just knows it from, from these sort of sacred text to some sort of monster that went around killing people. Um, and so that was the one thing that was one thing that I, it made me feel like this wasn't just sort of like a pro Catholic, you know, take no. on, uh, on everything because um, like so much of the message of the book seems to be about how the past is distorted by the passage of time. Oh, absolutely. No, I don't, I don't mean to, to say it that way. And, and I, and I, I think that like the first, the first part of the book was my favorite, I think, because of that. Uh, and I think it was in the first part where we get uh, the section where it's sort of like a, a biblical-like passage. It may have actually been the second part. Uh, the, second, yeah. the second part where they're talking about the apocalypse in, in like biblical language, but they're talking about the nuclear war and the way they describe it just gave me the chills. I was like, that's, that's brilliant. It's just like, yes, this is how people would mythologize something so horrible. I mean... I think, you know, sort of broadening my criticism of the book a little bit is, is like, it's not necessarily about how the uh, Leibowitz's Jewish aspect was portrayed, but just in the sense, like, for me, there is no central protagonist of this book, except the protagonist of keeping human knowledge alive. That's the protagonist, right? So, so it's like this omniscient point of view, we're keeping human knowledge alive. That's what's dr going through the story. But it seemed to me that uh, kind of echo echoing a little bit of what Lisa said is like, we never really get that story. Like we get it in the first section where brother Francis is trying to copy down these uh, ancient technical drawings. They look like engineering plans. So he doesn't know what, what the hell they are, but he's laboriously copying them for 10 years. I thought that was beautiful. I love that. It's just like, I'm going to turn this into this illuminated manuscript. It's probably like, you know, transistor radio but he's he's got like you know this beautiful manuscript like that to me was just beautiful just to show like how art and science and like this just real the struggle to keep everything alive but it sort of diverges from that the second section you know where, where Thon Th uh, Thaddeus I think it was who uh, today today is you know inventing or rediscovering a lot of this stuff but we're given a really distant POV from Judea and even, you know, he's not really even a central character uh, for part of it. And then by the, by the third one, the third section, it's just, it seems to me like it's dropped the whole, like that whole subplot entirely. And it's just this kind of moral discussion on whether or not euthanasia is acceptable. And then it's like, Oh, well, we're just going to send the knowledge off into space and maybe it'll survive. And, to me, it was like, I felt that it was sort of a cop-out from the promise of the beginning. Uh, the promise of the beginning of the novel is we want to keep science alive. We want to keep knowledge alive. I wanted to see that struggle. I wanted to be there in the moment. I wanted to be 
like next to Brother Francis, like someone like Brother Francis throughout and struggling and seeing how in each age there's a struggle. I wanted to see someone like Galileo saying, no, look, you know, uh, we're, we're not, Earth is not the center of the solar system. It's, you know, and orbits are, you know, elliptical. And I wanted the church to, how dare you? You know, we've been believing for the last 800 years that it's X. It can't be Y. And I wanted to see that, but but we're not given that. Well, I, I guess like, well, for, uh, let, me, let me get other people in here too, but I'll, yeah. I'll just say from yeah. my point of view, I feel like science fiction does that a lot where the church mm -hmm. is just sort of like mindlessly you know, anti-science or something. I, I thought it was, in, this was interesting that it was doing something different in this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, let me get Lisa in here. Lisa, do you, what, just overall, do you, like, you do, what's your kind of impression of how good this book is? Having of how good this it? book is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with an, actually a number of things Matthew's saying. I do think that the point of view pulls outward over the course of the three novelettes. And I do feel by the, the I, I'm sort of, largely lost by the, by the last third of it because the debate feels so perfunctory. And as, as a woman who um, you know, is not part of the Catholic Church anymore because it was really difficult to grow up and see yourself represented there nowhere um, or in very minimalized ways, you know, um, it's kind of that last third where you've got a man from the church and a man from the state arguing over the fate of women and children and mm -hmm. the women and children don't seem to have a voice or perspective. And I was really struck earlier when Joe had said, you know, there's these two perspectives being fought out here. And it's as if there are only two perspectives. And I frankly get kind of frustrated by that at the end. I feel like what really works in the earlier parts are the human elements. And we just, I don't get as much of that in the third one. Um, it, it it just it feels like it drops. It's trying to tie up too many loose ends and do a last debate to really feel much like a story about humans, which is ironic about in a story about the end of humanity. Hmm. About Joe, what are, I don't know if we've if you've said how much did you like like how how would you rate this book? How much do you like it? I, I loved it. I mean, I I I thought it was I just really. One of the best science fiction, not probably one of the best novels that I've read recently. So, um, I mean, I was struck in the the center, the the central section, the, the the middle part, in that you know there's that debate more or less between you know Thon Tadeo, who's who gives that dinner speech basically before all the monks, and shares as best he can you know, the import of the new discoveries. Uh, and actually, I really liked that before dinner, he kind of explains uh, to the abbot why trying to explain the scientific findings without the math is sort of pointless, because the mathematics are actually the simplest way to explain things. I, I just thought, well, that's like what a physicist would say. <laughs> um, but, but then he talks about how, you know, there's going to be an age in which uh, truth and reason will prevail, you know, and everything will be good. And, you know, I sort of thought of that middle section as kind of the, you know, in some sense, it's the early modern, you know, the analog to the early modern period. So, you know, everything from, you know, Galileo and the Reformation uh, up to the Age of Enlightenment, you could almost imagine Voltaire giving part of that speech about how reason would make everything better. And, you know, it, it, in some sense, you know, this is Miller's Catholicism. It does seem that there are sort of, there are two options. There's the, you know, God is the transcendent principle and it's the most important thing. Or, you know, products of human will are the most important thing. And that's the, you know, in his account, the the demonic principle. And, and and those are the alternatives. And and Thon Tadeo is presenting kind of the attractive case for this sort of humanism, you know. And not only do the monks reject it, but you know, there's that marvelous scene where Benjamin comes in, you know, and and sort of hobbles up to the podium and gives the guy a good stare, and says, "No, you're not it either," right? And then walks out, and. And I've struggled a lot with what to make of of, of Benjamin slash Lazarus, right? He's called mm -hmm. uh, Lazarus in the third part, and you know the at least the 
suggestion is he's the Lazarus that Christ raises from the dead, but who doesn't accept Christ as the Messiah. And, you know, so he's looking for, let's say, you know, the ultimate, you know, the sort of what would be the thing worth worshiping in the world. And he's looking for this and he never finds it. And and I think that makes him very sympathetic because nothing, you know, we shouldn't worship reason simply, uh, I think, either. And and so anyway, that that yeah. his his unanswerable quest is is interesting. Well, let me pick up on that because I, I the, one of the things I thought was interesting is that Thon Tadeo has this scientific theory, and 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 there's a there's a work he references about mankind's creating machines who rise up against them. It sounded to me like R U R by Carl Chapek. <laughs> yes. Um. But but basically he th- he he has this whole elaborate theory about how this means that the hum- the present human species is actually a creation of a prior human species and we know of course this is completely wrong but that he's complete he's he's arrived at completely wrong conclusions just like the people who like um you, you know like i was i was saying mm. to Matt earlier that that throughout the book we see these sort of flawed um mundane things become worshiped or you know sanctified in an in a later you know in a subsequent era and so it was just interesting to me that, that Miller there seems to be portraying both science and religion as being subject to the same process of completely, you know, of, of, of drawing completely wrong inferences from the records uh, that history leaves behind. Yeah, that's so really I, interesting. I think one thing that I, I agree with you, obviously, it, it's it's meant to be resonant of these earlier periods in history, but it's also very much of its moment and and again weirdly resonant right now um yeah. right because one of the things that people are hashing out at the middle of the 20th century is where what is the state of science as we're moving from small independent laboratories to larger uh university based labs or state sponsored labs or corporate labs right like i feel like part of what ton uh, thon T- tadio has to um negotiate right is is he going to put his um you know, where, where, which side does he go with? Where is, is the power? How do you negotiate this? Do you, you know, do what the state asks you to do, or do you do what's morally right? Um, which apparently the two can't be the same, um, at least not within those contexts. And I can certainly see where that would have been of interest to people thinking about that, like, where is science going to ally itself in the 1950s and 60s? And I think I feel it again today, not as a scientist, but as an academic, uh, increasingly, uh, if you follow any academic news, and it's totally cool if none of you do, but uh, we're getting a lot of uh, state university board of regents who are getting pretty activist. And so there's this interesting tension between uh, the, the needs of the state and the needs of corporations and then sort of whatever are the pure goals of academia. And uh, so I sort of was was feeling for, for Don Tadio and all of that uh, <laughs> yeah. drama for quite frankly, in, in, in that part. Um, and actually I wanted more focalization on that character for that, for particularly that reason. He felt like yeah. he was in a weird, tough spot and yet he's kind of treated as just sort of smug and a little more blank than I wanted. Yeah. yeah I mean, let me just, let me just explain and then I'll get to Matt is that for, for people, the plot basically at this point is that in the first section, we see the monks have all these old technical documents and things and they have no idea. They can't make heads or tails of them. They're just copying them without understanding them. And now we're 600 years later and there's this brilliant young scientist who comes to the monastery. And he's actually in a position to understand these documents and, and rediscover some of the great scientific advances that had, had been lost in the past. And then this sets the stage for the, the third section of the book where society and science have all rebuilt itself and now nuclear war is uh, is a looming uh, a potential once again. Um, okay. So Matt, but Matt, what were you going to say? Um, yeah, I mean, I was just going to jump off, um, from what Lisa was saying in, in terms of like, you know, the parts of the book where the, the society at large human culture is rejecting scientists is rejecting learning in general was something that if you had read, you know, in the nineties, like, like you saw Dave in some of the reviews, like, Oh, you know, this is ridiculous. But like, we're seeing this today. Like there's very strong anti-science attitudes. Um, we saw it like with the COVID response, we're seeing it with, with, um, you know, uh, other crazy beliefs, um, you know, and so I, I feel like that part was, was actually un- scarily realistic. 
and the struggle that you have when, when to, of presenting science in a simple way to people who don't understand it, and then to for them to um, try to interpret it, and then the interpretations are, are sometimes completely wrong, or, or you know, it's like you, know, you see today where people like say, "Oh, look, you know, uh, quantum mechanics means that I can think <laughs> something into reality," you know, um, <laughs> you know. It, so, so that part of it I thought was was. Uh, was really well done. Um, but I, I just wanted to cut, go back a little bit to something what, what Lisa said, you know, you were talking about that, that the, the women and the children didn't have a voice. And, you know, I, I remember I got to the point in the book and uh, where there was like uh, excerpts from a, an interview, like with a reporter. And then it was like reporter, reporter, lady reporter. And I'm like, really? Like, you know, <laughs> Like, couldn't the other reporter have been have been a woman? Like, and it just made me think. I'm like, oh, I'm I'm trying to go back and like, how many major women char- female characters are in the book? And I couldn't think think of any. And it was like kind of shocking to me that there there wasn't uh, more of a of a voice, you know, of a woman's voice throughout. And and it oh, was it- kind of, yeah. Oh, I was gonna say it doesn't surprise me at all. This is a book written by a Catholic about abortion and yeah. euthanasia. Uh, there's a reason no woman's voice is in here. That's all I'm going to yeah. say. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, what I'm saying is I'm I'm not surprised that someone would do this, but it's sort of like it, it seems to me that there is like again there's there's entire subjects that are that are elided, you know. So it's like what yeah. I was saying before, like with, with with the you know the idea that the church was sometimes you know um antagonistic to science that was elided over and, and then the there's no women's voices in this book that was elided over so yeah yeah no i i told i mean i i definitely noticed that i don't think there's any speaking part for a female character in the first two novellas except like one woman who comes in and sees a guy bathing and and runs out mm-hmm. so i mean I'll, I'll i'll stipulate that's a weakness of, of the novel that uh you know that there aren't I mean, although you you mentioned, I guess, I guess sort of the only female character that really sticks in my mind at all is this um, Rachel, Mrs. What's her right. name? Mrs. Who has two heads? Uh, yeah. something with yeah, the Grimes. 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 Grail, Grails. 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 Uh, um. So Grails. yeah. Well, I, uh, actually, what? So why don't why don't we get into that? So 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 Matt mentioned. So I guess one thing that surprised me about this and that seems different from a lot of other post-apocalyptic science fiction novels that I've read is that you do have these supernatural characters. So Matt mentioned this Benjamin Lazarus character who seems to be, yes, some sort of, um, well, what's the word, sort of combination of of the wandering Jew and Lazarus. And then you have Mrs. Grails, who's a mutant, and she has this sort of second head of a kind of a baby, an innocent baby growing out of her shoulder. And we basically find out at the end that, that this, this head, the second head that she has is some, some, uh, post-human, right? It's post-humanity. Yeah. Well, well, but it's, it's like some sort of throwback to e- the garden of Eden and a well, pre-fall. Yeah. Right. Pre-human. It's innocent. Of, yeah. It's um, innocent. Right. Right. Yes. So, so I guess let's just, so, so what, do, what does everyone, uh, uh, I want to get Joe back in here too. So what, what do you think about the um, appearance of these sort of supernatural beings in this post-apocalyptic science fiction novel? Well, I mean, you know, in, in, in some sense, we're supposed to believe this is a miracle, right? That, um, that, that Rachel is, is either Eve again or, or Christ again. Um, and, you know, the, the abbot goes to baptize her and she kind of waves him off. Like, I don't need to be baptized. And, you know, she picks up the host and gives the priest communion. And you're like, wow, that's again, you know, within, within the, the, the sort of Catholic frame of reference, you know, that's sort of a, you know, clear indication of her sort of extraordinary holy status, you know, exactly what it is. I think we don't necessarily know. And, you know, I think it, it, it's one of the more hopeful moments in the book that, you know, yeah. sort of the Christian story is, you know, if, you know, God can turn even the 
worst of evils into something good, you know, so from, you know, original sin comes, you know, Christ and all of that, um, from the nuclear Holocaust, you know, we get this new birth of innocence or possibly second incarnation, possibly second coming. Um, you know, that's the moment where, where we're with, where the author, I guess, is is not giving up on the story, right? Even, mm-hmm. even as the last spaceship is going to blast off of Earth, you know, and they're given the, you know, they kick the dust of the Earth off their sandals, right? They've been rejected by the Earth. This is a, an allusion to a, a New Testament thing, and then, you know, they're told, you know, you should imagine Earth now is Eden, and you should never try to go back. And so on the one hand, right, we're witnessing the basically the, the implied death of the earth. But on the other hand, we've had these moments of hope. Well, maybe, you know, the third time we'll figure stuff out. <laughs> yeah. You know, it occurs to me as you're talking, I wonder if that's why we have no female perspectives earlier, because it's a much bigger punch at the end when the second coming is, is, is the first woman or female you've encountered in the book, basically. Mm. I mean, yeah, there's a certain I, narrative drama there, for sure. Yeah, I think one of the things that's so interesting to me about this book is the way that, I mean, it clearly it seems clear to, to me that Miller has a very misanthropic, you know, baseline attitude. I mean, I think he had pretty bad PTSD after World War II. Uh, he has this view of the the sort of inevitable collapse of technological civilization. But then he's sort of, in a way, obligated by his Catholicism to have some some hope or some, you know, and, and so it's, it's, it's sort of this interesting, there, there's sort of, one of the things that's so interesting to me about this book is that the author is clearly being pulled in so many different directions and in sort of, you know, yeah. he loves hmm. science, he loves religion, yeah. he hates humanity, but he's obligated to have <laughs> faith, you know, and, and it makes it not simple in any way. It's sort of this complex amalgam of all these competing philosophies and ideas and sentiments and things. Yeah, I mean, I think that's both its strength and its weakness, um, mm-hmm. because there's so many ideas in here, and and like I I think each one of these sections could be an entire novel. Um, they don't, they feel just weakly linked to me because I like like I said before, I think the promise of the beginning doesn't quite match up with how it ends. I mean. Um, you know, to me, it's just like kind of a, a, a retelling of of the uh, the Noah story, right? The, the flood. So it's like you know, the, the earth got corrupt. God destroyed the earth, started over. Oh, they got corrupt again. Let's just start. You know, um, and I I I think I wanted more from it. I, I wanted more from the end. It was just like you know, you 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 go through three hundred and fifty pages of this book or whatever, and you get to the end, and it's like, well, yep, humanity just did it all over again. Um, and, you know, I think, yeah, Miller definitely wanted to put in that little nugget of hope. You have, uh, Rachel who might be the the innocent, the, the new sentient species on earth or, or, and then you have the, uh, the arc, you know, going off into Mm -hmm. space with, with, uh, preserving the human knowledge. Um, but I, I felt like in a lot of ways, the execution of it was, uh, was a little like stilted for me. Um, but I just was re- remembered something I wanted to talk about. There, there were actually, um, a couple of, of, uh, TV programs that rip riffed off of Canical for Leibowitz. Uh, if, if anyone has ever seen, there was a, uh, a Babylon five episode, uh, that takes place a million years in the future. And they're replaying archives of a monk who uh it, it's oh, basically they right. oh, yeah. yeah they completely ri- uh, ripped <laughs> off Canical for Leibowitz and they talk mm-hmm. about like starting it and um that was actually the first Babylon 5 episode I ever saw and I said what is this show I need to watch the show <laughs> immediately um but that to me I mean again it's TV's different medium but it, it felt like it, it was a more uh satisfying narrative because it it had the promise that like Societies in ruins. There's nothing left of, of the earth except um, a small uh, order of monks whose task it is to preserve knowledge for posterity. 
and then they they actually show the steps and and it, it was like it's kind of like you know when you start the Lord of the Rings books and you know that the that the small little hobbit at the beginning is going to do this amazing thing and you read it all over again because it's the build up to that like that part of it I found really exciting. The other the other thing was there was a uh, Voyager episode where a an alien race discovers the Doctor's hologram and relives episodes from Voyager's history uh like cuz basically the doctor's hologram is kept in a museum uh and then it's oh, hundreds of right. years in the future and then they go back and and uh retell the story so so yeah i mean there there were definite um i'm sure there's there's more that 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 riff off uh canical um well well let me just say i mean it's been a really success like financially successful uh, you know, influential book. I mean, you know, from from when it was published, I think it's never been out of print. I think it's gone through something like forty five reprintings. Uh, apparently, Miller kind of lived off the royalties for the rest of his life and never published another book in his lifetime. Um, I think partly because he didn't have to, and also I, I think he maybe felt nothing that he did would compare favorably. Or like everything he did would be compared unfavorably to to Canical for Leibowitz, but there's clearly something about the book that's captivated a lot of people since it was published. Well, it talks about issues that were important at the beginning of the contemporary moment and that remain important to us today, as we were saying, right? Um, one thing I want to go back to really quickly in part three, I I, I said before, and I, I stand by it. I don't mind the vignette structure, but. Why does Benjamin slash Lazarus not come back in part three? Mm -hmm. I'm so yeah. confused by this. Like yep. that's all, I, you know what? If that happened, so many of my other complaints might just fall away. Just, I don't know. I feel, it feels unfinished to me without that. Yeah, but here, it, here I thought about this a lot and here's my hypothesis. So let me know what you think. Um, yeah. You know, if he, because the thing you want, the thing I guess from a Catholic point of view one might want would be him to see Rachel, you know, and say, what is the nunc dimittis? I think it's the Latin for it. Like now right, I've seen right. my savior and I can die. Right. And, but, but in a sense, you know, what, what makes him so compelling to me in a sense is that there's no, there's no like earthly incarnation like no person is the like ultimate good that you would bow down before and worship. And so he, you know, his whole thing is like, he's searching for essentially God in the world and can never find it because, and of course he can't, because, you know, from, from a certain conception, God has to be other, you know, it's the, the sort mm -hmm. of ultimate out there. And, you know, it, and so since we want to keep that aspect of it, he can't meet Rachel. And then like, what else would he be doing in part three? He could meet Rachel and say, you're not it either. That would be pretty mind blowing. Well, it would be, I think it'd be much less a <laughs> Catholic I, book at that point. But. Yeah, no, I see your point. And actually I, I, I get that. And I, I think you're right. Uh, and you had actually sort of come at it from a different angle earlier where you said, he says uh, the cat, the Catholic church isn't it. And then later he says, science isn't it. And it's like, okay, well, if neither of those institutions and clearly the state's not it, then I can sort of see why he doesn't show up in three because there really is no solution. That makes sense from his framework. But, well, maybe this is just part of the great, big, grand, beautiful mess. That's this story, right? <laughs> like narr narratively, I kind of want one thing to happen. And maybe as a Catholic or as a cradle Catholic, I sort of want that thing to happen too. But the two are tied together. But you're right that there are other reasons why it can't happen, right? It's this is such a weird comparison, but in some ways, I, the more we talk about this, more this book feels like Southland Tales, that movie, just like <laughs> this great, big, fascinating mess of ideas that I, I, I don't know if I like it, but I like to talk about it and think about it. You know, Right. I mean, just coming from my own Jewish background, I didn't really find Benjamin's plight to be Jewish. Like I, I, <laughs> I like this, you know, um, there's definitely not a focus on the Messiah as a, as a like person that to be worshiped. I mean, th there is some talk of that, but it's really just a focus very much on the now and, and uh, finding joy in the moment. And 
um, not much focus on the uh, on an afterlife or, or eternity, um, uh, at least in the tradition that I was brought up in. And it it just seemed that I guess in a, in a lot of ways, I, I, I wondered if, if Miller actually spoke to anyone who was Jewish. Cause, cause like yeah, I, there was, there was actually like, like, you know, I, I don't speak Hebrew, but you know, like every Jewish kid, I went to Hebrew school and uh, so I can read the alphabet. Right. So I can do phonetics and uh, the, the, the letters are wrong. Like, like uh, multiple times. I'm like, that's not the right letter. So I, I don't know if that was just a, you know, an editorial mistake or or if it was something that Miller himself did. He's like, oh yeah, that looks right, and I'm like, no, that that's completely <laughs> wrong. Like you have the wrong letter. That's not how it would sound. Um, but but again, you know, um, I I like the idea. You don't see it very often. Um, in, in I think contemporary fiction is is this uh, religion and science kind of together in the, in the same story. And like both of the, like, you know, you often see like, Oh, you know, science poo pooing on religion or vice versa, but it's never like we value both of these. And even though we accept that both, uh, both of them might not have all the answers. And uh, I think it was interesting why they, at least with the copy I had, they chose to do the introduction by Mary Doria Russell, because in the Sparrow, it's basically mm -hmm. the only group that can get themselves together to go, fly to the planet with with uh, other sentient life are the mormons <laughs> so so it, it was um no it's it, the catholics it, in the sparrow isn't it i thought it was the mormons no uh, that's in no no the mormons go to space in uh the core the um in the expanse that oh, okay it was the catholics i thought it was yeah you know it what is, you might, no, it you is might the catholics be right because it is because i remember speaking with her at wisconsin and she was telling me that Antonio Banderas had bought the rights to it because he wanted to play the priest. Okay. And I super wish wow. that had happened. Oh, I know, right? Like <laughs> the movie that should have been made. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah, I haven't read The Sparrow, so I, 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 I can't. Oh, it's, oh, it's, the, I, it's oh, the Jesuits. It. It's the Jesuits. I just, Jesuits. I just yes, Googled Jesuits. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, not you're right. The Mormons was The Expanse, yes. Um. um. Yeah. And uh, I, I, when Matt was talking, though, about, you know, like um, Babylon 5 and um, Star Trek Voyager and stuff, it was making me think I, I did want to mention how inter it, it's interesting how this fits into a tradition of science fiction. I mean, like when I was reading this book, I couldn't help thinking of, you know, Foundation, you know, Asimov's Foundation yes. and Nightfall, mm -hmm. um, where, you know, it's sort of like a, in a way it's like a combination of those two where you have both the the cycles of civilization being destroyed and rising again. And then the the small group determined to preserve knowledge, scientific knowledge through the Dark Ages. Um, and then like this was published, what, like couple years after Fahrenheit 451. And so the idea of these book leggers who memorize books and preserve them and stuff seems to me pretty likely to have been influenced by that. Um, I also wanted to mention, I mean, like, if, if you haven't read this book, I mean, it, it seems a lot that I, I think the best known example of this sort of black humor thing would be Dr. Strangelove. And I can't help thinking whether that was, you know, was influenced by this, you know, this this idea of treating nuclear, thermonuclear war as this sort of, you know, black comedy. Um, and then I also, I just wanted to mention the book of the new sun by Gene Wolf, yeah. who's, mm -hmm. which is another work written by a, a zealous, you know, recent convert to Catholicism. Um, I guess also deals with sort of, you know, the collapse of civilization, you know, Collapse and, civil, collapse and rise of civilization over ages. But yeah, sorry, Lisa, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say Clifford Simic, he, had, uh, he wrote books about robot popes. Remember the Project Pope? Does anyone know this book? It's an awesome no. book. No? <laughs> no? It's so good. Yeah, well, actually, Simic wrote a lot of stories about robots and religion. And then he has this novel. It's from 1981. It's called Project Pope. And the, um, oh, yeah, Catholicism makes it throughout the galaxy, but only because robots take it over. <laughs> <laughs> and it's cool it's it's actually it's a really it's a fun story and it's very hopeful actually so just to prove you can write a story about robots and catholicism and the galaxy and it can turn out okay <laughs> mm. how about other people uh, is does anyone else when you were reading this did it remind you or make you think of any other movies or books or anything 
Like, it is there made, anything you would compare this to? It, so it made me think of Cloud Atlas. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, wow. Know, it, just the, the sort of, I mean, Cloud Atlas nests the stories so that you begin and end with the first story and right, the second and the second to last are the same one. But the idea that, so that structure isn't, isn't preserved, but the, the little hints of threads that connect the different time eras, uh, you know, I sort of like that, you know, we get brother Francis's skull there at the very end, for Mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that he's actually, you know, the venerable brother Francis. And, you know, we had sort of known him right as a much more, much different kind of guy. And then the, the way the, Oh, what's his the the jester the the poet from part two gets referenced you know in part three again and uh just those little yeah, as, de- a, as a saint at, mm-hmm. uh at, right is possibly a saint and he can't quite believe it and uh and then the glass eye had been carried on as a you know what some important object through the the family line of uh, like, a whole, like a holy relic kind like of. a holy relic yeah it just those little details reminded me of the kind of hints and connections in the structure in, in Cloud Atlas. And, you know, also that has its own kind of pessimistic take on a, you know, dystopian future ending and, you know, the what destruction of technological civilization out of its own hubris and greed. So. Yeah, I, I guess I meant to mention also another um, similarity between this and Foundation is like the pretty big jumps in time between mm. each story and the fact that each story is basically just people talking to each other. I mean, yeah. there's almost no physical action in this book at all. And actually, the one part where there is physical danger is actually one of my favorite parts of the book, the part Matt mentioned where you have in the first section, Brother Francis has this illuminated manuscript he's been working on for 10 or 15 years or something. And there's this bandit who uh, is is going to take the the relic and his duplication of it away from him. That was heartbreaking. And mistakes, yeah. And and mistakes the in the end mistakes the duplication. You know, thinks that the duplication is the valuable one because it's got gold leaf and and on illustrations and all this stuff. Well, I thought that was really well done because it was like you know he spends all this time and then he loses it, but then you realize that actually saved the knowledge. That like if he if it wasn't so beautiful that he would have just taken both of them or destroyed both of them and then you know and then that would have been that. Um, so I, I was like, oh okay, that's that's uh, I like that. Um, one of my other favorite parts, and I know this you're going to think I'm I'm a horrible person, is is when when uh, in the last section when uh, um, I think it was Zerchi was describing the the cat that that wouldn't die. Yeah, yeah. And oh, and I was like, that's so horrible. It was so awful. I thought I was reading a horror story and um, just describes how he tries to euthanize the cat and the cat just won't die. And then he's burying the cat and the cat's climbing out of the hole and so horrible. And I'm thinking, I'm like, is this a metaphor for humanity? Is this like, you know, is this what God's doing to to us? Like, oh, I'm trying to kill this race, but they just keep coming back. (laughs) Um, Yeah, it was it was pretty powerful. Um, And I, 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 I wish there were more of that stuff in the story. Cause I, I think that uh, when we're in that close third person point of view and really feeling it, like when brother Francis is about to lose, you know, 10 years of his work, or when we're hearing this horror story of someone, you know, having to euthanize a beloved cat, like I was really, really connected with it. But when we're, when we're like in this sort of zoomed out view, looking at the whole world and all the stuff that's going on, I, I wasn't as uh, connected with the story. Yeah, I mean, I was definitely real. I mean, and as someone who's like more sympathetic to the the doctor's point of view in that situation, but I did find that that anecdote really moving, and just this idea of the, you know, the 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 way he describes it in the stories. You know, the cat just, you know, it just wants to live, even though there's it has nothing worth living for. It just has this instinct that it wants to live, and it just wants to crawl into this bush and just live like whatever life has to offer. It mm-hmm. just wants to experience that at any cost. And I thought that was a really well formulated um, argument. You know, I mean, um, yeah. that, that's that's just the way, you know, like 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 I say, that the book, 
doesn't present anything and any of the viewpoints is is silly you know it's it's sort of morally serious about about everything yeah um how about lisa do you have any other any favorite parts or any other parts you wanted to talk about yeah, there is one other part, like while we're talking about hope, the one thing, you know, I, I, I still think this third section leaves me colder than the other sections for a variety of reasons. But I did like the sort of meditations on hope that sort of come to fruition in section three, even though ironically, it's a totally it happens in these very hopeless moments. But well, it's not ironic, actually, that's the whole point. But there's, um, it's, it's just a sort of short passage where after the nuclear event happens um, and there's the 10 day freeze and then everyone's kind of girded for this to be the end of the world again. And then it's, it is eventually, but not immediately, right? Like there's a few months in between there. And there's a moment where Zerchi realizes he starts planning again for the next day and the next week. And it starts sort of thinking about how hope creeps back up on you. And, and you, you do plan for the future, even when you sort of feel like there is no future. And I just, I don't know. I thought that was another one of those kind of weirdly moving moments in here that I not weirdly moving, but, uh, you know, and profoundly moving. And I wanted more of those. If we're going to yeah, meditate on hope, let's talk about hope. Well, I think that's one of the things that the book brings up is this question of like, you know, could could we ever stop developing new technology? You know, could we ever say, you know, we don't want nuclear weapons? Like, 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 basically, like, if we invent nuclear weapons, at some point, somebody's going to use them and destroy everything. And then we'll either all be dead or starting over from scratch, basically. And like, could we ever make a choice as a, as a world to say, like, no, this, this level of technology is, is good enough, and we're going to stop here. And I think that's an interesting question. I mean, it seems like, well, probably not like, uh, it's go ahead, the man. question, it's the question of science, right? Science is built around a notion of progress. And where does that stop? But the idea of progress is a relatively new phenomenon. And mm -hmm. like, you know, it, up until, you know, I mean, I'm not an historian, but maybe 17th, 18th century was around the time that people started to realize that there was this progression of technology. But like, yes. um, so, you know, humanity went, you know, like for the, the Middle Ages, you know, a thousand years without a lot of technological progress and it was just considered that's the way it is. So like, it might not necessarily be a conscious thing, but it might just be like, well, that's just how we live now. And, and, uh, well, yeah. no, I mean, there are cultures now in the modern world that say it's enough and, mm -hmm. and we can stop. There are, uh, you know, a con there are small countries across Africa, for instance, that are, are trying that out rather than sort of doing like continual capitalist expansion you yeah. know, instead of saying, how much money can we get for this? They say, what do our people need? And when is it enough? And that's a really different kind of question. Yeah, degro like, degrowth like, uh, movement yes, in, uh, in yes. the West. Yeah. Or like the Amish, right? Like, could you ever have mm -hmm. something like that? I don't know, Joe, what do you think? What, could, could you ever, what do you think well, about this idea of like, should we stop technology at a certain point? I mean, there's, I feel like we all need to go back and read Hobbes, right? That, um, <laughs> you know, in, in, in a, competitive environment. I mean, somebody is going to hit upon the idea of securing advantage by increasing technological mastery and power. And so, you know, sure. I mean, we could unilaterally disarm tomorrow. Um, right. And there were, I mean, I, I definitely remember I went to college in the 1980s and, you know, there was a fairly active, you know, it was a very interesting literature because it was both sort of secular people on the very far left and also uh, some Catholic philosophers who were like, you know, nuclear war is a moral abomination. You can, you know, in good conscience, never launch a thermonuclear attack on cities or, you know, population centers. And that's what all these bombs are for. Therefore, we should not have them and we should unilaterally disarm. And like, okay, but we didn't do that. And we didn't do that because well, the Soviets weren't going to unilaterally disarm and the, you know, they were, the Chinese wouldn't have followed us and we were afraid of being at their mercy. And, and so, you know, this competitive structure in this anarchic world is going to make it awfully hard for anybody to say, okay, you know, I want to get off. Like the Amish can do it yeah. because they get left alone or maybe they're willing to be martyred if it comes to that. Um, 
how many people are willing to be martyred if it comes to that. Yeah, it's, I, it's, I mean, it's, let me just ask. So, so do you think, Joe, that the logic is basically like, do you agree with me that if nuclear weapons exist and enough time goes by, someone's going to use them? And as long as there's this competition, someone's going to develop them in the first place. So it's just this that Walter Miller is right, basically, that we're just stuck on this like Ferris wheel of hell and we can never get off. The, I think the question is, can we, you know, can there be like another Hiroshima Nagasaki moment without the full exchange, right? So, I mean, I've got to believe they're going to get used again someday. But, you know, are they used once or, you know, a tit for tat exchange and then that's it? Or, you know, once once people's blood is up because you've already lost a city and 10 million people, you know, you're just going to let it all fly. So I don't know. I don't have a great answer, David. I guess I'm hopeful that we'll find the wisdom not to use them or continue to find the wisdom not to use them as they haven't been used since 45, but I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's the mutually assured destruction, right? So it's like uh, no one uses nuclear weapons because they're afraid of the retaliation. Uh, But yeah, it's it's frightening to think that uh, we are closer now than we ever have been to to uh, using nukes. Um, and you know, if uh, in in uh, science fiction circles, you hear something called uh, the Great Filter, right? So it's it's like the Fer- mm. the Fer- the Fermi paradox. Like, if we're doing the math right, and we're probably not, but let's say that we're we're, we're guessing correctly, there should be you know. A, a hundred million alien civilizations out in the gap, just in the galaxy, or maybe not that many, but there should be some, right? But why aren't we seeing them? Um, and so one answer is there's, there's a great filter. There's a point at which uh, society reaches a certain level of technology where they create the ability to annihilate themselves, whether it's through nuclear war or through, uh, you know, uh, bioweapons or, or some other destructive capability. So, the question is, have we passed our great filter or do we have one yet to come? And, mm. and, and, uh, um, I think Miller is saying, you know, it's, it's on the horizon, um, which is, it's pretty bleak from my point of view, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a, a, uh, realistic optimist. I don't stick my head in the sand, but I, I think that, uh, you know, we're, we're a pretty clever species. We've, we've gotten through some, some really, severe bottlenecks in the past. I think we'll, we'll get through this one too. Do you remember the last episode of uh, Star Trek, the next generation, you know, in which yeah. Q yes. puts me the trial never yes. ends. Mm-hmm. Yes. I think that the great filter never ends, right? But yeah. we're always in a permanent trial. Yeah. To find well, our way also, through it. Yeah. And, and like we were saying earlier, I mean, it's sort of startling the degree to which, people became complacent about nuclear war. I mean, you know, you had all these books and movies and everything in the 50s and 60s and 70s, I guess into the 80s. And then kind of people were like, well, don't have to worry about that anymore. When, when really the situation had not changed materially uh, that much. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think this is why people do need to keep reading and writing books like this is because, you know, it's so easy to get complacent about these sorts of dangers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Um, I mean, this is like one of the original critical dystopias. Part of the reason it's so awful is to get you off your butt and out in the streets protesting or doing something to change the future, right? I mean, it's pretty scary. It should do that (laughs) amongst its other things it does. The United States has 6,000 nukes and uh, Russia also has about that many. And then there's a handful of nations around the world that also have nukes. So it's it's kind of frightening. Uh, You know, I grew up... uh, in the in the eighties, and um, I think I was one of the last generations to do duck and cover. You know where you mm-hmm. where you practice hiding under your desk from a nuclear bomb, which is totally going to save you. Um, uh, but yeah, so so I grew up with fear of of nuclear holocaust. Uh, had nightmares about it, and then I think you know it was after uh, the Soviet Union collapsed in the early nineties that uh, it was sort of uh, went away. Everyone's like, oh, you know, we're we're friends now. Obviously, we know that's not true. Uh, at this point, but uh, yeah, I think I think it was just we thought that was something that was another generation, but it turns out it's not. 
Well, I think the other thing too, it's, I, I, I'm interested by your reference to doing the duck and cover stuff in school. Like my, I own and operate a 13 year old and, you know, they do active shooter uh, drills yes, instead. Yeah. And, mm. you know, sometimes maybe we don't talk about nuclear war because there are other dangers a lot more imminent. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, obviously that's uh, ext- much more personal and horrific and actually happening, you know? Right. Yeah. It's sad they have to do any of these things, right? Yes. Mm. Yeah. Let me just, before we run out of time, I just want, I was, I sort of went crazy doing research on Walter Miller this morning. Uh, and it, there was actually like some, kind of some int- interesting stuff I found. So I emailed everyone that, you know, I wasn't sure whether the title was pronounced Canical for Leibowitz or Canical for Leibowitz. And I don't know if people saw my email, but, you know, this, this high school teacher describes calling Walter Miller in the, I think in the seventies and asking them, asking him, how do you, how do you pronounce it? And he, he says, I'm, I'm not really sure. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. And this is the book had been out for 20 or 30 years at that point. And, you know, I don't uh, know if he'd never been asked about, you would think he would have been asked about that all the time, but I guess he was this really reclusive well, person. Um, I, I think that speaks to Matt's point that he may not have spoken with any Jewish people before writing these stories. I mean, I, yeah. I, I've, I grew up knowing, some Lebo, Lebowitzes, and that's how we always said it. Uh, uh-huh. You know, it was, it was uh, went to high school with uh, a Lebowitz, and uh, I think at my parents' synagogue there may have been Lebowitz. And, and whenever I've heard it spoken, that's how it's always pronounced. Mm-hmm. Uh, I will say in, in Walter Miller's defense, I mean, I, I read that he stopped writing when he was 36. So wow. he was pretty mm-hmm. young when he that wrote is. this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if I had read it, I would have, I would not have thought it was written by somebody in there early thirties. I mean, mm-hmm. it seems like so much more, uh, you know, so, so, someone who's, who's had a lot more experiences than that. Um, but, but this, this I thought was funny. So, um, uh, Miller, Miller's agent says that Miller was the only client who he never met in person. And Miller once wrote a, a fan letter to another author praising his work. But then at the bottom, he wrote, P.S. This does not mean I want to meet you. <laughs> that's Terry, that's, that, was, that was Terry Bisson who ended up uh, finishing the sequel. Oh, he was the funny. author that Miller wrote to? In the article, they, they uh, in parentheses, they said Bisson. So I, I, thought... I, I think I think he was the source for that that anecdote. Uh, OK, he was the I think source. That's what that, that means. OK, all right. I thought I thought it was a letter to him. Um. So let's see. And there's also there, there was this thing about at one point, uh, I, th- I think, Lisa, you've read Judith Merrill's memoir, right? Because it, yes. apparently at one point in it, she, she apparently uh, at one point Miller was separated from his wife and was living with Judith Merrill, mm-hmm. who was, I think, still married to Fred Pohl at the time. And there was a confrontation between Pohl and Miller in which Miller pulled out his deer rifle, which apparently he kept with him all the time is what it says. Uh, and they had a scuffle and pole, you know, wrestled him to the ground. But uh, it was just stuff like that I was finding out this morning. I was like, wow, I, I definitely never knew that. I had forgotten all about the Judith Merrill thing. That's, yeah. And wasn't, didn't they have their affair while he was writing a canical for Leibowitz or some part of it? I'm pretty sure. So there's that uh, too. I'd, I'd have to double check. I don't know, maybe. Uh, no, I think this was earlier because it says it was around 53. Oh, I'm not, yeah, I'm not that's a... much earlier then. You're right. So, yeah. So I don't know. I, I don't know what else I would find. So, apparently, I don't think there's much. There's a ton of biographical info about Miller out there because he was so, you know, sort of reclusive and didn't give a lot of interviews or anything. But I wonder what else what else is out there if I if I kept looking. Mm. Um. So, yeah, I just wanted to to mention those. Uh, and so Lisa, you said you've read the, uh, the sequel. I, I did uh, again, a long, long ago, like 20 years ago. And I don't remember much about it. Uh, I remember thinking it was nice to read. I was actually very excited because I was really hoping we were going to go into Rachel's world. And uh-huh. that was not even remotely what happened. Right. So you'd get bumped back and write. It, it's a story that takes place in between stories two and three here. And I think that if you enjoy the world he's building and want to hear more about that timeline, it's nice because it fills in a little bit more of the timeline. And I do remember that one being more of a proper novel, Matt. So you might like it more. It has more of a sort of narrative through line and definitely more uh, focus on the main character and sort of the thoughts in their heads. 
And I also remember thinking it, it as a really interesting attempt to deal with uh, certain indigenous mythologies and sort of explore their relationship to, you know, uh, to like Christian systems of belief. Uh, but I also don't really remember much else beyond it. So probably worth reading. And I did read some reviews of it again today. And everyone says, pretty good, probably worth reading. So I'm going to just <laughs> go with that. That's sort of what I, I where I stand on it, too. Yeah. Um, I guess I did want to mention, like, if you like this, in addition to the things I already mentioned, I'd also recommend uh, This is the Way the World Ends by James Morrow, which is about, yeah, sort of the the, the moral horror of, of nuclear war and earth abides by george r stewart which is another uh it's actually 49 but but basically 50s post-apocalyptic novel and it has it's sort of an interesting counterpoint to canical for Leibowitz because the the premise of earth abides is that the main character there's this library and he's just trying to preserve the library at all costs and uh you yeah. know I mean, it I just reminded me of, uh, you know, this is basically Station Eleven, right? It's, it's, it's a preservation of, of art after a, a pandemic kills 99% of the world. Um, that's a big plot point in that book. And there's a yeah. Twilight Zone yeah. from this era, too, right? About uh, It's called Time Enough at Last from season yeah. one about the librarian who's actually really excited about nuclear war having happened. I think he's a banker. Always, he's a banker. Is he a banker? But, That's right. Yeah. Okay. And now, but he's finally going to have time to read everything. To read all the books that he has. <laughs> to read all yeah. the books. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Well, that, that's sort of like a basic theme of science fiction is, you know, is sort of the smart people, you know, the smart people versus the ignorant people. And, and we sort of like to well, put ourselves in the role, you know, cast mm -hmm. ourselves as the smart people and, there's something sort of self-aggrandizing about a lot of science fiction that does that. But I mean, sort of, you know, you can see the kind of person who reads a lot of science fiction. Well, why fan, that fans are slan. Fans are slans, yeah. right? So we're, we're all misunderstood superheroes of tomorrow, just waiting for our moment to lead humanity kicking and screaming into the future. Mm -hmm. It's true. It's true. Yeah. Can I make a plug for while we're talking about um, nuclear war novels? I would, of yeah. course, recommend Judith Merrill's 1949 nuclear uh, war novel, Shadow on the Hearth, uh, right, which looks at, first of all, uh, just to get a woman's perspective in there, right? And it all, it tells about like the, the fallout from, kind of literally, from World War hmm. III as it's experienced by um, a, a wife and mother in the New York suburbs. And, you know, the real threat turns out not to be so much fallout as, um, the civil service police who decide that this is their, you know, chance to run wild in the neighborhoods and mm -hmm. and uh, comfort all the ladies who lost their husbands in the in, in, the, in the New York bombing. Oh, it's it's a nutty story. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's interesting. Do, do, do you know, at least given, given that Miller and Merrill lived together for a period, do you know what influence one had on the other in terms of that and Canticle for Leibowitz? You know, I don't know, but Meryl Wright would have been the, I think, more experienced of the two authors at that time. So, but I don't, I don't have any sense of anything about that at all. It's a great question. Um, uh -huh. You know, it's probably, I mean, how much was he hanging out with Campbell and his crew, right? Because Campbell was the one who was really pushing people to think through nuclear stuff sometimes. I don't know. It's a good question. I have no idea what the answer is to that. I also kind of like, have any of you ever read, I think it's, um, is it Pat Frank's Alas Babylon? I can't remember if it's Frank. It's yeah. 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 Pat, yeah I, re I read it in high school. Yeah. That is a weird one. And I, I, I read it right when I had moved to the South as a Northerner transplanted to the South. And well, it is a real Southern book. I don't even know what to say. I've never known what to say about it. It's super anti-government. But then it imagines that Southerners build a like multiracial utopia once the government goes away. And it's like, really? This is, this is, this? It was so strange. I thought it was such an odd book. Kind of liked it. Yeah, though. I haven't Weird. read it since high school, but, but I remember my impression, you know, they're in the Turkey City lexicon, they have something called the cozy catastrophe, whereas there's mm -hmm. like a nuclear war or something, yes. but, yes. but it's kind of fun yes. for the protagonists. And, and it sort of, yes. it sort of struck me as like, I'm, I'm like a nuclear war couldn't possibly be this, uh, comfortable oh, come on you'll have a great exactly. time what are you doing oh, yeah they, it's amazing they build this little like you know post-racial and uh, utopia and it's it's weird and you're like seriously okay 1959 south maybe i guess somewhere um but yeah nutty nutty stuff yeah 
I want to give Joe, Joe did you, is there anything else uh, that you wanted to mention or that you've been wanting to say? I think we've mostly covered it, Dave. Thanks. Okay. Do you have any recommendations for, for people who liked uh, Mechanical for Leibowitz? Wow. Um, I, my, my science fiction chops are not up to uh, my fellow panelists. So, <laughs> uh, well, I guess I'd, I'd make a plug for Cloud Atlas. Okay. Um, do you want to just, if people haven't, haven't read it, do you want to just say, like, why should they check it out? Well, so it, it, it has um, sort of a, a complex ring structure. There are, I want to say, five or six nested stories. Um, and the, the each later story connects in, in some way to the previous one. So like the, I think it's the second, people in the second story find... Uh, the diary or something of the people in the first story and, 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 and so on. But it, um, it, you know, as, as you move forward through time, so it starts, I think in the 18th or 19th century and, and, and moves forward. Um, it's got this, you know, interesting combination of darkly comic uh, and actually funny, but sort of darkly funny uh, perspectives on each era of human society and then we sort of get to a you know a technological dystopia which is i think the the south korea episode and then you know the central episode is a sort of post-apocalyptic um you know here's the world trying to begin again um and so that that sense of structure and also kind of um the self-destructive potential within whatever modern technological society. I think those themes are, are common. Uh, Cloud Atlas is not Catholic in the way this is Catholic. So if, if this would have bothered you, the Catholicism would have bothered anyone. Then, then I think it's, it's more clearly sec Cloud Atlas is more clearly secular, but then I think with less, there's a hint of hope to it, but it, you know, it doesn't have the sort of mystical rebirth of, primal innocence or second coming kind of um, Catholic hope that, that Miller has. Mm -hmm. I guess I'll just mention too, uh, if you're a fan of the fallout video games, apparently they, I, I watched a, um, mm. a lecture where they said that explicitly that they were influenced by canical for, for Leibowitz. So if you're a fan of those games, maybe oh, that no will kidding. Uh, entice oh. you to, to give it a try. Uh, can I just say two quick yeah. uh, post-apocalyptic books? Uh, so, um, I don't know how well it's known in the genre world, but it's called ice by Anna Cavan or Cavan. I'm not sure yes. That. Mm -hmm. That's a and, great book. And it's about like, it, it's not really explained, but ice is slowly taking over the world and the world is shrinking. And then this man is very, very obsessed with this white haired woman and, and follows her like all the way across the world as the ice just sweeps over everything. And it's very hallucinogenic and dreamlike, but it, it's, uh, it's it's really moving. It was one of the the best books I've read in a while. And then uh, I just finished um, Bewilderment by Richard Powers, which is not technically post apocalyptic, but it's it's basically it's sort of like um, a not too exaggerated version of the 2016 to 2020 years in the United States, um, where things got a lot worse than they actually were uh even though they were pretty bad uh they got even worse and society starting to collapse but it's it's a very personal story about a father a single father trying to ra raise his uh autistic son and um there is echoes of flowers for algernon and that's all i'll say um but it was incredibly moving and really depressing but also like canical for Leibowitz had that um nugget of hope in there uh that uh made it uh really beautiful all right cool yes yeah, so everyone uh go check out all those recommendations and we're pretty much out of time so let's get into some final thoughts here uh so lisa final thoughts on canico for leibowitz there's a reason it's a classic that's never been out of print i think it's a great big beautiful mess and even if it's not in my top 20 favorite novels of all time, I always recommend it to people and I recommend you all check it out. 
Yeah, you said in over email that you ju- you would when I contacted you, you had just recommended it to somebody like that week yes. or something. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. I think it uh, holds so much of the promise of science fiction in it. So many big ideas, so many sort of dips into interesting character moments, and just that huge span of time. Big ideas, big 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 canvas for big ideas. Yeah, absolutely. So, how about Matt? Final thoughts. Um, so, you know, I. I enjoyed lots of part, parts of this. Um, it's not my favorite book, but I thought that there's so many great ideas in this book. Like uh, any one of these ideas could spin off into a, 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 another novel and, and be fantastic. Um, as a completist, if you're looking to really understand uh, sort of the, the history of post-apocalyptic science fiction and really get a, a strong sense of how, how uh all those stories have been influenced by this book. I think you should absolutely read it. Uh, it's not my favorite book, but I'm glad I got to revisit it. Yeah. And again, I thought it was terrific. I mean, I sort of going into it, I, I, I kind of knew what it was about. And, you know, I was like, oh, you know, 50s post-apocalyptic novel, you know, science fiction novel. I wasn't expecting it to be that surprising or have, you know, be super literary or anything. It was actually, it was, it was much more literary. It was much, much more humor and black humor and, uh, in philosophical ideas and everything that I was expecting. And I, re- I really liked it again, like a uh, little slow, but, um, but I would definitely, you know, it, it repays the, uh, it rewards the, the effort. Um, and so how about Joe, what's your final take on Canico for Leibowitz? I, I guess my view is a little closer to Lisa's than Matthew's. I, I really like it. I would recommend this uh, wholeheartedly. Um, you know, Big ideas, thoughtfully presented. Um, there's no, n- nothing is shown in a really kind of shallow or straw man kind of way. So it really does provoke thinking, um, you know, and there's no obvious solution to any of the problems it raises. So that I think part of the charm yeah. of the book is it leaves you with all these these questions to ponder. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah. so everyone go check it out. And so we're going to wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with Matthew Kressel, Lisa Yazik, and Joseph Reiser. So thanks, everyone, so much for joining us. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Matthew Kressel, Lisa Yazik, and Joseph Reiser for joining us on the show. This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy was made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoyed the show and want it to continue, please support us on Patreon over at patreon.com slash geeks or via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.